You're listening to Time to Talk Australia. Be sure to find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts or iHeartRadio. We'll get set. We're about to talk to a man who has written for Roseanne, The Golden Girls and The Brady Bunch Movie. You will absolutely know some of the famous lines that he has penned. Stan Zimmerman is in the fortress talking us through the sometimes brutal world of sitcom writing. Coming to you from the mountain fortress of pop culture. You're listening to Time to Talk. And he thinks I'm super cool. Sure, Jan. Just that you've made me laugh, and I don't think there's a bigger compliment than that. That's important. I have found that laughter gets you through a lot in life. And um, one of the few things that my father actually uh, said that had an effect on me was um, he said that I uh, looked at life through rose-colored glasses. And I didn't know what that meant as a kid, and he actually bought me purple glasses. (laughs) But it it was... um, just my outlook on life. And it, as my mother said, I came out laughing and I use that method in my writing. I use it as I teach actors how to literally be in the moment and not ignore it and um, embrace it and lean into it, even if it feels awful. I, I, looking back at these juggernauts, right, of the 80s and the 90s, I'm talking things like Roseanne and Golden Girls, and there are so many more as well. I'm curious because I'm I'm starting to feel it, and I'm wondering if it's a real thing or if it's just a me aging thing. Is the golden era of TV comedy well and truly behind us? Do you think, or oh, am I just gosh, too romantic? No. Do you know how many times I've heard people say that yeah. sitcoms are dead? I've lived when you get to be as old as I am. You get to, you live through many many phases where people say comedy's dead, but I think now television is in another golden age. I mean, just the vast amount of work and content that's out there and different kinds of content. And luckily now different voices are being heard and more diverse voices. And, you know, when I was starting out, it really was a white, straight, male uh, profession. And I remember even just reading from my little house in a suburb of Detroit, Michigan, that Gary Marshall and his writing staff used to play basketball in between work. I was like, oh, I'm, I'm screwed because I can't do the basketball, so yeah. I'll never work in Hollywood. And um, when we first came out here, my writing partner, Jim Berg, and I were told, you know, we had to stay in the closet to keep a job. And so many people of all ages find that very shocking, especially on a show as progressive as Golden Girls was but we really could not talk about our personal lives then. But there was something very special about that type of show in the 80s and 90s, wasn't there? I mean, a lot of it was bad. I have to put up my hand. It's not all romantic. There was plenty of shows where you thought, oh, like I'm, I know that you probably can't say it, but I can things like Growing Pains and Who's the Boss, just inane drivel, really. But then you got those. <laughs> but they had good theme songs. They had great theme songs. I, I often go down a YouTube rabbit hole of listening to those. Well, and I might... actually created a, a theater musical using over 40 TV theme songs. Oh, how and fun. It, it's called It's On, and we've done a couple workshops with it. We did uh, Megan Hilty was in one of the workshops. She Go was on. In, on Smash, and she's utterly brilliant. And she did a torch ballad version of Charles in Charge. <laughs> that will give you the respect for that show, even though Scott Baio, we, we won't talk about now. But um, anyway, uh, he actually wanted to direct an episode of a TV show. Um, and oh. I just got this very odd vibe from him. But um, mm. on a more positive note, um, so the uh, Cheryl Lee Ralph from the original Dream Girls was in the show. So we're still hoping to put that, get that up and going because I think it would be so popular. And it just... It was so fun to sit in the back of the theater during those shows and see people as each song came up and the emotions that each one of those shows brings back for people. But one of the ways you can compare then with now, in my opinion, is to look at some of the revivals and the reboots of old shows, right? Mm -hmm. And 
I'm going to be brutally honest here. Although uh, there's absolutely a nostalgia factor, 100%, and I'm just as excited as the next person when they bring back one of my old shows, I've got to tell you, Stan, from, from my point of view, the writing is almost uniformly uninspired. And I'm just going to get specific here. I'll look at Roseanne came back as the Connors, right? Mm-hmm. Oh, well, came back as Roseanne in the first place. Yes. The beauty of that show originally for me was it, there was such a truth in it. Um, mm-hmm. She and always made sure her writing staff always told the story first and comedy was kind of secondary. It definitely fell from the story. But the reboot, well, and honestly, living in fear of her firing any one of us. I was in that year when, uh, I'm sure you know the story, when she gave out, her and Tom Arnold, gave out T-shirts with numbers on it. And there were 21 writers that year. Because mm-hmm. they brought on a lot of their stand-up comedy friends who weren't writers at the time. And so the first day of filming, they had us all get our T-shirts, pick a T-shirt. And that way, they wouldn't have to learn our names. They could just point and say, number 13, you're fired. And uh, my birthday is October 13th, so I I still have that 13 um, T-shirt. At the the time, I didn't understand how offensive it was. And I later learned, because the writers, other writers were very upset by that whole idea. I I thought it was an old wives' tale, but it's true. No, it's true. I think I've worn it two or three times. I just want to... You never got fired? Well, we did get fired. Um... The end of the season, well, they also told us when you go down to the set for run-throughs, don't let Roseanne see the whites of your eyes because then she could fire you. So I just found the tallest person and stood behind them (laughs) up until we wrote the lesbian kiss episode. And then we heard, who the hell wrote this? And all the writers parted and pointed to me and Jim. And they kind of pushed us up to her. And it was like, you know, going to see the, you know, the, the powerful Oz you know, with the fire and you're scared. Mm-hmm. And and then she was like, this is fucking funny. And she loved it. And she fought for it. And she got You won nominated. an award for that, Roseanne. Um, uh, we got well. nominated for a Writer's Guild uh. Award. It was our second. Golden Girls was our first nomination. Can um, I dig into that episode a little bit? Because obviously, on. like the, the, the lesbian kiss episode, right? It's like it's a brilliant episode for a start. I always thought with Roseanne there was uh, like a room of writers, but it seems like is that an episode that you and your writing partner Jim wrote together alone, or were there a group um, of writers? We actually, um, it was during the Northridge huge earthquake. We were writing it. I have pictures of Jim underneath a table during one of the aftershocks. <laughs> um, <laughs> so. Wow. Uh, yeah, there was a guy named Michael that we uh, worked on it with. Um, so now you couldn't do it, but Tom Arnold used to run through the halls yelling, where are my gay guys? Where are my gay writers? And that really? was me and Jim, yeah. So mm. the cool thing was that, uh, and it's, it's something we learned on Golden Girls, was to challenge the characters, who they are. So like on um, Golden Girls with... Uh, the episode about sexual harassment and Rue McClanahan and Blanche's character, we thought, because she kept saying to us, you know, really give me meaty stuff. So we learned early on, you know, look at who the character is and, and throw something at them. You know, like with Blanche, you know, she's always, sex is always her answer. But what if there was a situation where she felt like she couldn't have sex with somebody? So with Roseanne, we were thinking, you know, she's so hip and cool what would kind of rock their world? And what if she got kissed by a woman? And then suddenly it's like, well, how do I feel about it? And how does everyone else around me feel? And um, so that's how that came about. Not knowing that the network would literally say, you, we're not letting you film the episode. And it, it was her- an amazing reaction. And what I loved about the actual story of that was that she wasn't so much confronted by the kiss, in my opinion, I don't know if this is what you were trying to get through, but by her reaction to the kiss, she was confronted by how she was so confronted by the actual yeah. kiss. Yeah, and we did it with another episode, um, the driver's seat, um, because in the show she talked about being uh, physically abused by her father and hit by him. So we thought, what would happen if she ended up hitting DJ because mm. he stole the car? And then there's a beautiful scene where she's sitting at um, the kitchen table I and love she it. doesn't have a, a word. And I, that was the first time I really saw her as an actress and she did end up winning an Emmy uh, that season because 
it was real. I mean, she just, she took that moment and, and luckily they allowed just to focus the camera on her and what that meant to her. Is she just going to repeat the cycle of abuse? And that's what I loved about Roseanne was that we were able to deal with real issues in a funny way, but also in a real way. And not to jump to a whole other topic, and you'll, you'll want me to come back for two more hours of this, but in 2015, I Sony um, had me go to Moscow to help them develop a Russian Roseanne show. I read about this. Now, how the devil would you do that in Russia? It was very difficult. So right before I left, um, the Russian government came out with um, a law that said you couldn't talk about homosexuality. So, of course, I called Sony and I said, that's going to kind of be a problem. I don't really want to go to jail there because um, I'm not a fan of Siberia or anything super cold. And um, they said, don't worry. You know, the first couple of seasons, that wasn't really part of the show. But I thought, well, but what if someone over there says, well, what episode did you write? And, you know, anyway, uh, I was never asked those questions. And uh, I kept hoping I would get another job and not have to go. But the world meant for me to go there. And it was such a marvelous experience. And I met great people. Did it get off the ground? Did it go No, it did not. They could never find the right actor. And um, I think part of the problem, it was funny because I had known that Roseanne came out of comedy clubs. So I said, as soon as I get over there, I'll go to every comedy club and we'll find the Russian Roseanne. Uh, (laughs) We did auditioned a lot of women that was really interesting because i got there and i had to pick a director and i found a stage director who didn't speak much english and i had to be in those auditions and even though i didn't speak russian we pretty much agreed on who the funny actors were probably like 98 percent of the time it's funny is funny and um, we would film the auditions in an office and give them to the network but because the networks did not have years of experience like they do here, the executive said, well, why is Roseanne in an office building? And we're like, it's an audition. <laughs> You're not understanding. You know, we don't have sets yet. So when I came back in the fall of that year, uh, they were still making, and they still are, which is crazy, a Russian version of Everybody Loves Raymond. That's one of the biggest hits wow. in the history of Russia. Yeah. And so I had this brilliant idea, we'll use their kitchen and do screen tests. And we just moved the furniture around a little bit. Um, and I, I liked uh, one or two of the actors a lot. And the network just could never agree on who that person was. So. Wow, it would have been a fascinating watch, even if it didn't work so much. It would have been great to watch that get up. I want to stay on Roseanne for a bit more and talk to you about the Golden Girls after. I'm really curious to know, with writers... How does all that work, the interaction between actors and writers? Each show is very different. Um, The Golden Girls, especially because we were there season one, they were really wonderful And that almost every talk show that they went on, they said it's all the writing. It's not They did. Oh, yes. It's so crazy because they're the best actors (laughs) around at the time. I mean, they were just – they knew the sitcom form and were brilliant at it. So that was really sweet. Roseanne, um, I mean, those are amazing actors, John Goodman and Lloyd Metcalf. um, And they did acknowledge that the writing was really good on that show. Although, you know, with Roseanne, it's like they just replaced writers and replaced them and replaced them. So there was a feeling that, you know, we'll just get somebody else if they don't do what we want. Uh, How long were you there for? We were just there a year. So that blew up um, because... Tom and Roseanne um, got divorced. So I don't know if you remember the whole I do. thing where they, I guess she had thought he was having an affair with their um, development person, Kim. Mm-hmm. And then Roseanne, to get them back, said she was going to do a three-way marriage. Anyway, she kicked him out of the house. And then it became two camps. And I guess we were in the Tom Arnold camp. Can I, so was it as dysfunctional as as what everyone says? So far, everything you're saying, I mean, numbering, to be honest with you, that story makes me a bit sick in the guts. It's not funny to me, like numbering the writers like that. Like, did they do it as a joke or was it serious? They thought they were being funny. 
Right. Okay. But no one else right. thought that was funny. It was, you know, that's how you're starting the job. It was just um, very odd. But I have to say that, you know, Tom Arnold really kept the, the motor of the show going. Well, everyone says once he went, the show started to show signs of, of cracks. And I think that was around the end of season six from memory. Yes. And then, you and, know, it just went nuts with her winning the lottery and all of that. And oh, like, that then it just it went off the rails, I think. I, I love the show and I, I actually did like it when it came back. And I was so sorry that she exploded again but you know, so tell me about that i'm glad you've circled back to that stan yes. like, because i was i remember i was asking it like what was curious to know what you thought of the reboot because for me that the, the characters became parodies of themselves it was like you know that rhythm that you get in those sitcoms line line punchline yeah. line line punchline and it was like that's not how it used to be and becky for example who the first becky used to think was such a brilliant actress as a see, um, yeah. teenager so realistic and she never had real funny lines per se her humor came from the fact that she just was an awesome teenager yeah. she's come back and she in particular like just written like a two-dimensional parody i, li- and I like lacy um i love her i love her yeah. but the writing um, is just it's not truthful anymore i think a lot happened I, mean, I thought there were some good things over the years, Jim, and I would say they really should bring it back. What would Roseanne think of, you know, during all the different presidencies? I was like, what would what would Roseanne mm. say? And mm. I think part of the problem was wherever she went mentally and becoming a Trumper was not the character of Roseanne Connor. So I think there was a disconnect, you know, when what she, happened with that stance? She was such a progressive woman, right? And nobody it, knows. I mean, that's what's so weird. She was. You know, when you look at the original show, she was a union person. She was fighting for the underdog, and then something happened. You for know? black Americans, for same-sex couple, she was she was the champion. And when I that know, tweet that's came what's out, so disturbing about it because yes, I so respect her for what she was saying with the show, and you hadn't really seen middle-class American family like that struggling and dealing with class issues on a TV show. So. I love that, but then I, she just got into this weird political viewpoint. What did you think when just, she tweeted that out? And then she did that. So I remember, I, I have a habit of getting up way too early, but I remember seeing that on my Facebook page or something, and I was like, holy, oh my God, this is bad. And then literally all of a sudden, it was Wanda Sykes quit the show, and I'm like, going, what is happening? And then she was fired. And then um, somebody that I know that worked at CNN, not that I knew very well, contacted me early in the morning and said, would you come on the Brooke Baldwin show and talk about it? I was like, "Um, should I? I didn't want to step in anything, but I figured I could go on and just talk about my my point of view of it. And um, a couple hours later, there I was on CNN doing my first live national interview and that was pretty scary stan should she have been hung out to dry like that let me let me just hear me out on this this is a lady who never got credit for how progressive she actually was on that show like even if you look at the subtle storylines in there she always treated every character with so much respect like she was she was an ecumenical abuser as judge judy would say right she's like she was as sarcastic and rude to every character but as loving and uh, giving in the end I mean, that's why those scenes with her and Dan in bed together were so important. And the scenes when she sat, you know, with Sarah Gilbert on mm. her bed, like it showed that she had loved Hot. her family and her family loved her. And that's why she could say anything. And that's yes. also the show they kept saying to us, she literally has to drive every scene, whether she's in it or not. It's called Roseanne for a reason. And that's why I couldn't continue to watch the Connors because there was just a hole in the show. And yes. um, I felt, to me, I felt like Jackie was the one that they were just making just kind of crazy. And oh, Laura Metcalf is yeah. such a brilliant actor. She can handle anything. Um, let her be it. Or Sarah's character. Let Darlene have a strong, strong, strong point of view. And it was kind of missing that. I mean, I would love to write those characters again. I think they're great characters. Um, and I love what they're, I mean, they're, they are still tackling a lot of great issues. Um, 
Not with the same heart, though. But to, to go back to that, when she was booted off, was yeah. it, hadn't she, hadn't she banked enough goodwill to, to for people no, to say, you know what, that's God. out of character? No, that's just the thing she hadn't. So they were just like, we just can't put up with this anymore. This is just one step beyond. And if you Google me and CNN, you'll get my point of view. But I always look at things as, as use life as a teachable moment. Like, instead of just saying, oh, it was, you know, Ambien that did it, or I didn't know she was black, or just say, you know what, I screwed up, but I need to learn. We can learn together. How can I learn? She has a lot of stand-up comic friends that could have said, this is why we find it offensive. You may not, and why are the reasons why you would not find it or not know? Like, discuss that. But in this country, we just don't want to have those difficult discussions around race, so we're still you know, dealing with it. Yeah. With Roseanne, I've got a different point of view from you. She, you're right. She didn't want to go deep into, you know, what's my teachable moment here. Um, what she was she effectively blamed saying. Blame people and blame well, drugs. And- well, yeah, a, yeah, but she also referred back to I am not a racist person. Look at my body of work. Look at what I've done. And I think that's a reasonable point if you look it back. It is a reasonable at- point, but if, she, if you offend somebody – Talk about it. Say, look, I'm a comic, and sometimes you go to the edge, and sometimes you go over it, and just say, like, just cop to it. I went over the edge. This, I can understand why. This, and she kind of did, and then she took it back, and then she's like, mm-hmm. you know, mm-hmm. fuck you all. And so she never quite really owned it. And I thought she that's- was brutalized, though, Stan. I mean, it's interesting the repercussions. Yeah, I'm, I'm not defending what she tweeted at all. I'm saying that in the United States, and it seems to be creeping across the globe, this whole idea that we're offended by what somebody said. And as a com- comedic writer, I'm fascinated to know what to hear what you think of this, because dangerous ideas should they just be shut down, or should they we sh- should they be allowed the oxygen? Um, of any other view, and then people can judge for themselves. Why pull her off the air? Why sack her? Why not just condemn what she said? They didn't want her out there. You know, and she had that second chance. It was a huge hit. And then it was just they like, what next? What why do we have to deal with this again and again and again? And I'm getting that- the feeling, Stan, that on, on set, she wasn't well, like, for example, the new daughter or granddaughter in the show, she came out and basically said Roseanne wasn't very nice generally on set. Well, Did look how other- she treated the writers. So she was and, – and the actors, when we were there, they lived in fear. I, I remember going down to the set and going, oh, my God, I'd seen Laurie Metcalf in her first play in New York, and I, I couldn't wait to tell her and I was all excited. I'm like, no, no, don't talk to, don't talk to me. Like, she didn't – she felt um, that if – Roseanne saw her talking to the writers. Who knows what? I mean, and that hang was on, sorry, of- Laurie Metcalf was not comfortable talking to you in case Roseanne learned of that. Is that what you're saying? I think, yeah. Well, also that that was one of the reasons why Lacey got fired because I think she started she had an affair with someone on the crew or something personal with her with them. So it was just you know Roseanne was always a little paranoid mm. and. Wow. Um, so that's why you just didn't talk to people. It was like you came down, you did your job, and you went back up there. And, you know, I personally learned, like, no, when I have a show, like, everybody should talk to everybody. Everybody, we're all in this together. You know, you want to love to go to work, and then you work even harder. And not, you know, Roseanne was the host of a party, and you, the host, creates the atmosphere. Hmm. That's a really interesting perspective. Uh, just tell me some of the, your favorite memorable lines that you contributed to Roseanne. And um, you might even want to set them up as a quiz because I'll know them. Oh my <laughs> I'm just God. Curi- curious to know what, pers- because you're in a writer's room, but I would imagine that when an episode comes on, you go, I wrote that one. Surely that's a bit of what you do as a you writer. Know, it? Maybe it's, um, you know, like PTSD, like, from that experience, I remember more like of the Golden Girl lines we wrote okay. than right. Roseanne or even Gilmore Girls. I mean, I know Brady because we were in that room and that was super intense. Well, we'll dig into the Golden Girls, but can I just I, – I do want to wrap up Roseanne by asking you this because I'm, I'm really interested. When we look back at the, the Gay Kiss episode of Roseanne, to circle back to that for just for a moment. You're obsessed. It's fascinating. How, well – I know. I'm kidding. 
<laughs> no, well, at the time, I was even perplexed by the reaction, like because it was, you know, a big media story as well. And I know that there was talk that they were not wanting to put it to air. They wouldn't let her write it. She had to fight very hard for no, it. No, it was that. so weird to go to work uh, and then come home at night, and it would be literally on the 11 o'clock local news as a story. Yeah. Yes. But then, but then when I actually look at the episode, and maybe even at the time I remember thinking this, but particularly now, it's actually quite conservative. You don't really see the kiss; it's depicted in a very discreet way, probably because yes. they had to negotiate I, I and compromise. I personally do not like that she wipes her mouth on her. On I wanted to ask you that. That's exactly where I, I'm leading. That was why? The one that, why? I think she thought it was funny, and to me, it undercut everything. And I and I said yes. to them, like, can we cut it? And they were like, are you crazy? We're not going to her and saying that. And I was like, um, I think if I'd been more vocal, but I let it be known. That wasn't her. written in the script then. No. I, and th- that when I saw that cut, and I guess they had to give us the cut just as a courtesy. But I'm like, guys, that's that's not the message I want to send with this such a powerful, positive episode. Should she feel disgusted by this or should she not? She's confused by how she feels. So maybe that's the beginning but of that. I'd rather I don't know. end on that. And we don't need the joke. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. But, you know, I, I get a lot, oh, Stan, you're so sensitive. And, you know, <laughs> don't let, just let it go. <laughs> you know, no one will really make a big deal. I'm like, no, this is a big deal. This is a big deal. So I'm curious to know when you take – um, a script that you've carefully written and put so much of your heart and soul into, and I know what it's like to take that word from there. And people don't get it's like a jigsaw puzzle. It's it's a, a labor of love, right? Then when you hand it over to actors, uh, are you surprised or ever surprised or disappointed by the way what you thought in your head is actually delivered by the actors? And can you give some examples of when you've seen your writing come alive through actors? It- you know, like we did a show on Lifetime for two years, Rita Rocks, and someone like Nicole Sullivan took our material and she just elevated it in a way that she, I don't know how to explain it. It's like, it's like a flower bloomed over every line. She was yeah. just, and that was just so cool to watch that. And then, you know, you get to know that rhythm of that specific actor. Um, and it just, it was just really fun to watch. Obviously with the Golden Girls, I mean, they all were so brilliant in their own way. And being there the first season, we got to see where they excelled in different areas. Or even like with the Brady Bunch, when you cast someone like Christine Taylor and Jennifer Lee Cox as Marsha and Jan, we were like, oh no, they need more material because they... Mm -hmm. They were on just another level. It was just so funny. So we just kept writing more and more and more for them. And even when we did something like um, we rewrote the Annie movie with Kathy Bates and Kristen Chenoweth and Alan Cumming, and when we saw Alan and Kristen together as Rooster and Lily, it was like, oh, no, they need more. Sometimes amateurs know best, and a lack of professionalism is all you'll hear on the Time to Talk show. Join Tim and his panel of guests as they wade their way through a range of news, music, and pop culture treats. Time to Talk, the show hosted by amateurs for unprofessional listeners. Amateurs, is this the best that they could do? You would have been quite a young man when you started writing for the Golden Girls, wouldn't you? Oh, I think I was like around 10 or 11. (laughs) <laughs> right let's, okay. go with, let's go with that let's yeah. go with that so uh, i guess the point being you were writing for older ladies was that difficult to, to be a young guy writing the words and the language and the behaviors of older ladies it's so funny because at the time we i just did it i was taught as when i started acting class at seven and a half or eight years old they said just go to a mall and watch people observe. And so I was always doing that and, and ended up doing it in my writing as well. And, um, you know, I watched the women in my life, my grandmother and my mother and my sister. And so I was always very sensitive about their sto- stories and the, and the women in my life, and their, you know, friends. It got me thinking of the book that I'm writing now for Indigo River Publishing called The Girls from Golden to Gilmore. And it's about all the wonderful women that I've worked with. And Roseanne, and um, 
<laughs> um, we'll see how she likes that. Um, Did you put that rude Roseanne line in the Golden Girls? Was that you? What? There's a line in the Golden Girls where they where they have a little pot shot at Roseanne. Um, they're doing a they're doing a commercial in the Golden Girls kitchen. No, they wouldn't have known Roseanne. Well, he goes in this character. They're filming a pizza commercial in the kitchen. He goes, "Look, if I wanted this kind of abuse, I'd be working on the Roseanne Bar Show." Where, where was that in? In the Golden Girls. No. Yes. Really? What what yeah. year? Like the last year? And they origin it's Rose is addicted to medication. That's the episode. Okay. She's um and she's in the kitchen and she's baking and she tells them all to get out and she How do I not com- know this? I know, it's very good. And she has a complete um as we call in Australia spack attack and she storms out, um, very unrose like. And the director packs up and they say, please stay and use the kitchen. And he goes, nope, if I wanted this kind of abuse, I would be working on the Roseanne Bar show. Well, everyone in town know, knew how awful she was. And, you oh, know, in the beginning. It's so was, sad to hear, you know, because she's a hero of mine. Right. But in, the beginning, in the beginning, I think it was a lot of, you know, she's a woman. Just be quiet. You're lucky you have a show. Um, and they didn't really respect – this was her life. It wasn't just a TV show to, them, to mm-hmm. her. Um, you know, I I wasn't there, so I don't know how she treated everybody, but I'm assuming – you know, and she's been very open about her issues with mental issue, with mental health. Give us a, a flavor of what it was like working on The Golden Girls. Uh, were you interacting with the cast very much? Were you segregated? No, only, only Estelle did we really connect with, and I would see her out of the – out of the studio. Um, Such a champion for the LGB community too, Estelle. Well, I've told the story, but I think our first day on the set, she came over to me and Jim and she was like, come here, psst, follow me. And I was like, what? What is Estelle doing? And she took us around the corner of the set and we're like, and she said, um, you're safe with me. Like we're, we're part of the same tribe. And we thought she meant Jewish and she meant gay. Mm. And so she knew we were, and she was like, it was, she was going to keep that a secret. So right away we knew it was not an open atmosphere to discuss that, but we knew that she had our back and it just made us love her instantly. No, I've, I've heard lots of stories uh, similar to that actually. And she was just, you know, such a, she embraced the community well before it was fashionable to do so. Yes, that's for but sure. Also, because I've been talking about doing a, writing a one woman show about her and learning a lot more that there was fear from her uh, when she was doing Torch Song Trilogy. She thought she could just, she would bring food for these guys that were getting sick and thinking that would be like a nice Jewish mother that would get them better. And then when they would go in the hospital, you know, because none of us knew what it was or could you get it. So there was a fear on her part of, Mm. you know, getting close or touching people. Why did you only write for one season of The Golden Girls? How come it didn't? Because the the, the season one of The Golden Girls. By the book. (laughs) Um, There was a very political situation with Whit Thomas um, that will be in the book. And then also will be in the book is my last um, recent, now now I guess it's about two years, um, Susan Harris and I on the phone. She was not very happy with um, when she found out we were writing the show called Silver Foxes. Right. Because I think... That was the male equivalent of The Golden Girls, wasn't it? Yeah, so I guess a lot of people come up to her and said, oh, I hear you're doing a reboot of Golden Girls with guys. And she's like, what are you talking about? And she accuses us of saying that, you know, we created Golden Girls. And I had to tell her, like, we would never say that. We were so lucky to have worked on the show just for the brief time that we did, you know, but a pivotal time in the first season. And um, I had to calm her down because she was just livid. I said, you know how the press is. It's easy for them to say a gay men's Golden Girls. I said, but look at everything I've said about our show. It is a shorthand way of, of describing it, but, you know, we are, you know, we learn from it, but it's not the same thing. And she did not make up ensemble shows, you know, she wasn't the first one to do it. Did that ever get up off the ground? No, but actually, uh, because I, I'm someone that doesn't take no very well, we have lately turned it into a one set play. Uh-huh. Um, and so actually last night, someone in Florida 
was contacting me about doing a reading of it next month. Um, but we would love to do it. I think that's a way to show the networks that are still um, scared of the show because they are homophobic and ageist. I mean, they those are two whammies for them. They think I literally had a big streaming company, which shall remain nameless, of their development person said, it just doesn't have broad appeal. It's a funny show and no, nope. and broad appeal, meaning, you know, young people won't watch it. And I keep saying, but Golden Girls. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. Um, it, will, yeah, it, will, but- it will get done one day. We're not going to stop. You did win an award, I think, for one of the episodes, Rose's Mother, wasn't it, in Series 1? Uh, we got nominated for a Writers Guild Award. Um, yeah. It actually was called uh, Blanche and the Younger Man, and I thought, well, we're never going to get an Emmy nomination for that. So I talked them into calling it AKA Rose's Mother. So I had a plan, uh-huh. and um, we didn't get nominated for an Emmy, but we did get nominated for a Writers Guild Award. And, and, and you're particularly proud of that episode, from what I understand. Well, yeah, I mean, you know, lines like that, stopping me from living isn't going to stop me from dying. Uh, I, I don't get, um, the only time I'm in a position like that is when I give birth in what black <laughs> dog years. I mean, like to have so many lines that are now iconic, we yeah. just had in, I think, literally our first draft of the script. How well did she deliver that? So that must be an example. When you write on paper, in what Blanche dog years, but Dorothy's pause, it's actually a quite a, uh, overstated pause of the delivery. It is, I mean, it's just that delivery impeccable. is so key. But for some reason, we wrote it in that, those words in that order with that comma. Like, I don't know how we knew that's how B. Arthur would be best delivering it. We just got her voice for some reason, which is yeah. so odd. Um, a few years ago, a theater company that actually gave me my first directing gig, um, they were doing a benefit for the theater. And then one of the producers was the producer of uh, Hot in Cleveland. And I happened to be shadowing the director because I wanted to direct sitcoms. And he said, oh, you know, is there an episode of Golden Girls that the cast of Hot in Cleveland could read that you could suggest? And I'm like, uh, hello, <laughs> how about one of mine? <laughs> <laughs> and um, so they did uh, Rose's Mother. And I'll never forget coming in to hear rehearsal of it. And I just stood there in awe thinking how young I was and why was I writing about this subject and how could I write about this subject? So it goes back to your question. It was yeah. this weird maturity in talking about mothers and daughters. And um that was, I was just kind of overwhelmed, like, wow, like that was in a weird way perceptive of it. I, it I was, remember. it was incredibly mature. But can I flip it around? Like, at this age, at this stage of life, where we've got different perspective and all of that, is there a storyline that you'd love to go back and write for the Golden Girls now with all the wisdom you've acquired throughout your lifetime? Have you thought, oh, I wish that I knew this because then I could have written that? Not to get too heavy, but um, aging and death. And, um, Mm -hmm. you know, I don't know if you saw this, but uh, my mother passed away at the beginning of June. So dealing with that, um, I think we could have, I would like to have touched upon more. Um, I, I did get to write about it in a play I wrote called Yes, Virginia, which is kind of in the vein of a Golden Girls episode. And it's about... Two women, uh, um, one kind of based on my mother and the other based on my black housekeeper, who in older age decide to live together to help each other out and create like this new kind of family. It must have been, there was a lot of it, like in Australia and the UK, we tend to, when there's a series, there's only a, like a, a small amount of episodes. In in America, it's astounding how many episodes oh you get God, in a series. Oh my God, so exhausted by the end of that. I mean, yeah, I was about to say, what is that like writing episode after episode? Well, the good thing is when residuals come. The bad thing, especially something <laughs> like Gilmore Girls, where they talk so fast that in our script, which is usually 60 pages, we'd have to write 90 pages of dialogue. Season one of The Golden Girls is, for me at least, very, it's, it's distinctly different. Well, it's very different from the rest. Like, it seems to take off. And and is it true um, that um, they film two 
um, versions like of it. Yes, of, back then, yeah, they, but then yeah. were you riding in between one and two? No, we were usually eating dinner. Right. And I was like, oh my God, I, I can't eat at a table with B. Arthur. Um, we spent a lot of the time petrified on that show. In awe or, or petrified? Well, in awe, but both, actually. Really? Uh, I was why in awe you, her, why were you petrified? Because she seemed scary. And and I I guess we had heard early on that she was like, you know, who are these young kids on the writing staff at the beginning? Remember at the beginning, nobody knew anything. They didn't know. You know, they mentioned that in an interview, don't you? They yeah, actually, I, I think it might have been B where she said, look, we did pull the producer or I can't remember his name now, but they, they loved him and said, you need to get some older writers here. Yeah. So think about us looking, and I think I looked like I was 15. And I was only 16 at the time. And, um, yeah, so she was not happy. But then when she saw the scripts come in, she's like, I'm wrong. <laughs> you know, we're good. You know, move, carry on. Um, but, you was know. Was she someone to be scared of no, in an intimidating presence? The, the more we learned about her, you just learned she's very vulnerable. And, you know, a lot Shy. of people that are, are mm. vulnerable, they put up a tough exterior so that, you, you know, you won't push too hard or, you know, and, um, mm. and as I understood it, she had a very, um, difficult divorce and she was very wounded, you know? And so the more I, we got to see her, we saw her more as a wounded bird, as opposed to this terrifying person. Let me ask you specifically this, cause it's, it's a big topic in golden girls community. The, the, the number of lines throughout all the seasons, even though I was told reliably, and I just don't agree with it, that it, it tailed off at some point. The lines about B. Arthur's appearance, did you ever write any of those? Did you have concerns about writing lines um, that described her as ugly? Yeah, I, I don't – I hope we never did anything. I know one line she says something about – that was before I had the hump on my back. Mm-hmm. And I think that kind of started it. But in my mind, she's making the joke. It's self-deprecating about her rather than other people saying she's ugly or. There know. were lots of examples of other people saying ugly. Blanche, it sounds like you swallowed a man. There's a little boy who say, oh, you're the bride of Frankenstein. Yeah, but, I think um, his later years, and that's what bothered me about the show, is that they just kept going back to the same well. Like, what I love about Roseanne is that the characters grew and changed. Yeah. Um, and 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 Golden Girls, it was a different time, and because they wanted the episodes to be able to air in any order in syndication, uh, it wasn't episodic the way Roseanne was. Uh, to me, it's like, well, you just saw them doing different versions of the same jokes as years went by. There were no arcs, were there? Exactly. Not and- really. And I have to say, I'm a massive Golden Girls fan, so I'm so loath to be critical of it. But the one thing that I do get a bit tired of is it almost doesn't matter what the setup is, it will land with a, a joke about Blanche's being a sex matey. I would have been, I would have loved to have seen something a little bit more with Blanche, for example. <laughs> all of them, all of them, like just Rose was dumb. Ro- you know, she was sexy, yeah. she was whatever. Um, yeah. Where would you have taken it? How would you have developed those characters? <sighs> Um, I think in challenging where, you know, maybe Blanche lost her sex drive. Like what would happen then? You know, what about if she'd had a bisexual experience, Stan, a bit like your Roseanne, a bit torn about, oh my goodness, because there's an awesome, awesome episode, isn't it? With the, with the uh, lesbian, lesbian, uh, (laughs) lesbian. lesbian. (laughs) Well, that was such a brilliant thing in that she was hurt that, that she, that she liked Rose. I mean, that was such a brilliant take on the whole thing. (laughs) And that's what was so great about the show, that discovery. You would never expect that to be her attitude. Um, but I think that would have been kind of interesting. Like, what if she did have a non-sexual, but she fell for this woman? Like, mm, and she mm. felt like that was her soulmate, but she's so used to it always being about sex. But what if it wasn't? Or what if, you know, there are certain medications now, I understand, that you lose your sex drive. I mean, th- those are all things that I, as a writer, would have loved to have pushed things like that, that, mm. that probably would not have gotten by because they would have felt oh, we can't lose what people love about the character. But to me, it just would show more depth to each character. Um, and even with adult education, when you can kiss my A, 
I yes. never thought we would get that by the censors. I thought, well, they're going to flag that and we'll have to come up with something else. And one of our episodes, we came up with the name St. Olaf. I mean, I remember we were sitting there with, you know, maps and things and coming up with different names and what could legally we use. And and then, you know, those stories just kept getting crazier and crazier and crazier. So hang on, you you coined the, the St. Olaf stories? We were in the room. I don't know who brought it up. So mm. I think we just came up with a bunch of different names and that sounded like... But I, I think it might have been in our episode, but it was in the room when we all were. And at that point, I think you had to find a city that something it wasn't really there or something so that legally we could just use it. I don't know what the rules were. Put but, a twist on it or whatever. Yeah. 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 You know, oh, like, no, no, I will not have a nice day. I mean, that is so crazy. I love that. That that, that is something we wrote. And I literally have a T-shirt. I, I'm holding a coffee cup with the picture of B. Arthur and that yellow phone with the cord. Um, that that is on a coffee mug that I had to, <laughs> I had to fucking pay for, too. Um, oh, did you? Yeah. That must have hurt. No, it, I should be given free. Some people do send me free things, and it's so sweet. Um but yeah, that I had to have that. But things like Shore Jan, like who knew that that would become a thing? Uh-oh. Please give us a flavor how you ended up not on the Golden Girls anymore, though. The reason is that Whit Thomas didn't want us back. Um, it was very political. So when we were brought on staff, they had a writer that they wanted to be on staff and the staff wanted us. So they had us both write a script very early on. Our script went on to be nominated for a Writers Guild Award, and the other woman, the woman's script, um, and no, nothing against her. She's a great writer. It was rewritten, had to be re- totally rewritten. Um, so, Whit Thomas, I don't think ever fully embraced us being on staff because it made them look bad that they that they were wrong, and so they again. Now you're making me tell the stuff that's in the book. Everybody yeah. had a director's chair with their name on it, except me and Jim. So it was little things like that that was like it was like, oh, you don't really, you're not really valuing us. You don't. Really. This isn't because you were uh, openly gay people. We you're were not openly gay, so maybe they knew it. I mean, maybe they were homophobic. I don't. Do know. Do you think that was a factor? You're not sure. You're not sure. We don't know. We don't. Mm. Um, well, uh, they missed out, didn't they? The only time Susan Harris ever talked to us was at the rap party and she loved what we had done. And obviously everyone, you know, from the actors on down were loving what we were writing. And she was like, I'll see you in a couple months and great job. So I left the rap party going, Hey, season two, here we go. <laughs> you know, and have a nice vacation and, and enjoy yourself over the summer. And nope. Um, but I wasn't shocked because I could. How just, do you find out that you're not coming back then? I think the, our agents called and told us that they're not picking up our option. And wow. I wasn't totally shocked. They liked keeping us kind of on pins and needles about it. Mm. And, um, that was not fun to go to work knowing you always had to prove yourself. And we, <laughs> was, we were not being paid a lot of money. We were the low men on the totem pole. And I think mm. we could have obviously offered a lot to that show in season two. Did you, and just finally on the Golden Girls, was there a particular character you loved writing for more than the others? Well, I I loved Estelle personally, so I loved writing for her. Um, But her lines had to be like killer jokes every time, so that was a lot. Obviously, B. Arthur's rhythm I think I had, but, you know, obviously there's a little slut inside of me that um, (laughs) could... (laughs) Put on a southern accent and, you know, just be reliant, I guess. And so that was funny just in our room because I come from an acting background. I would act out all the characters for my writing partner. Actually, I, I've, I've read that we can see a little bit of you in different things. Is it true? We can, if we pause, we can see you in Risky Business? Yes, you can. Um, Tom Cruise <laughs> put his, sh- his hand, hand on my shoulder as we walked down. Largemont, which is a street in LA, but it doubled for a city, a street in. Um, Did he have to reach up to do that? I wish. No. Um, <laughs> um, I we actually had history because when I was casting, working in a casting office in New York, he had come in just after Taps, and he had his hair, you know, the military haircut. Mm-hmm. And as again, as I tell in the book, you're getting all the all the gossip. 
he was jumping up and down on our couch like he did on Oprah. He was so excited that he was in a movie. And wow. I just remember he was just this beautiful boy and just energy. And like you knew he was going places. And of course, I reminded him because I had just moved to L.A. and I, I needed money. So I was like, that was just a, a money gig for a couple of days to you know do extra work. Sometimes amateurs know best. And the lack of professionalism is all you'll hear on the Time to Talk show. Join Tim and his panel of guests as they wade their way through a range of news, music, and pop culture treats. Time to Talk, the show hosted by amateurs for unprofessional listeners. Is it correct that you don't have a writing credit for the, the Brady movie? The first one we didn't. So we were the fifth writers on the movie. <clears throat> and the Writers Guild has a very antiquated rule that um, you can't have more than four writers on a movie. And um, But in the old days of Hollywood, if you look at the end credits, you'll see a lot of times they'll say additional dialogue by. Oh, they don't right. do that anymore because they thought they were protecting the original writers. But their system is so poor um, – that you have, there's a formula and you have to change scenes around and locations of scenes. So when we came on to the movie, they had already scouted the locations, set the schedule. And even though we literally rewrote pretty much everything within the scene, we didn't change the scenes. It's crazy. And it was very weird to be at the first big screening at Paramount and like laughs everywhere and you're seeing the dog trainer gets a credit and the bartender, but us, nope. So yeah, at the time, bad. it hurt a little bit, although everyone in town knew that, that that, I mean, you can't watch it and not know that's our sensibility of those jokes that are very out there and campy and gay and smart and silly all at the same time. I mean, that's that's us. I mean, we didn't come up with the concept of, of the Bradys in the past living at that, that time, which was a brilliant concept. But, man, we ran with it like <laughs> there was nobody's business. Back-to-back -back iconic lines in that first Brady movie in particular. Um, wh which one of those belonged to you? And Pretty what do you remember all, about most writing? Most of the dialogue did. We just kept pushing everything. Even silly sight gags like Shelley Long um, – pouring the sugar and it kept pouring and pouring and pouring and pouring. <laughs> That's yeah. all literally in the script. Right. So we just went through everything was like, okay, we can't change anything but the dialogue. So we just kept changing and adding all these jokes until Betty Thomas said, Oh no, that's too far, but she never did. So to us, like the whole thing, Carol Brady was so sugary sweet. So that just got us thinking. So we just kept having her or Mike telling stories. And her going, oh, Mike, and like all his stories, we just kept saying, you've got to make fun of his stories. So we kept adding stories to his different scenes. Stan, when I watched that for the first time, like you I cried. wasn't expecting you anything. Cried, you cried with happiness. I was expecting nothing, to be honest. I really was. Yeah. And then as like within the first 15 minutes of going, this is clever as, but the other thing that dawned on me is whoever wrote this or participated in writing this loved the original series well i grew up obsessed with it and i mm -hmm. did love it but then watching the episodes and we really watched more of them uh for the sequel because the first one they literally said we're hiring you for two weeks do a punch up do what you can and they loved what we did so then they hired us for another two weeks and then another two weeks and then come to the set and so they really couldn't get rid of us um, you loved this didn't you i can hear it in your voice oh this my was a God. fun because experience. it was it, it really tapped into everything I'd grown up with. You weren't living in fear on this one. No, we could be gay and open and and just again, it was it was. I I was told young when I was young that I was clever, so I was always I knew that, and it was such a positive thing to instill in a child. And so, to me, this movie, I was allowed to be really clever. You know, and even things like casting RuPaul, that was my idea. I just wow. happened to be at a gay bar and that supermodel video came on. No one had seen it. And we were reading actors and, and mostly black actresses. And um, and I just came in the next day and I said, 
I know I had, had a martini or two, but I think this idea could be funny. And um, he came in and met Betty, and that's what happened. <laughs> I don't know. Like, I, I totally get because I'm as the watcher, I can see how he fits in. But I, uh, uh, how you managed to work him into the script? It was so brilliant coming in as a school psychiatrist or whatever he was. Well, we knew um, we were we, that that character was in, in the movie. The hard thing was when we went to do the sequel, and, and they said, "Oh, it's going to take place during the summer," and so everybody said, "Well, I guess we're not going to be able to get RuPaul in it." And I'm like. Are you fucking kidding me? Give me give me ten minutes, and right away I came up with the Moesha 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 joke. I said, "Why can't they be at the pool?" And she had, and they run into her, and she had three daughters. And the minute I pitched that, literally out of my mouth, they're like, "It's in, get her up. She's there. RuPaul's there." And oh, it was that never so changed. Good. I don't know where they came from, but there you have it. The most epic thing I think I've ever seen in a comedy movie is when. <laughs> When they're sitting around, I know everyone talks about Shaw Jan, which is the famous meme and all of that sort of stuff, and it's great. But my more favourite line is from the same scene where she goes, something about, I'm going to go and raise money and we can get money from all our friends. And she goes, but Jan, you don't you have, have any friends. friends. Yeah. And when that face that that girl, I don't know who the actress Jennifer is. Cox, yeah. She's won, me, won my heart forever because that reaction, I, uh, unbelievable, priceless. And well, I again, do that face that all was, the time now at work when people offend me. <laughs> you know, being a middle child, I understood that. But also being unpopular and being, you know, bullied in, in junior high and spit on, uh, oh. I understood that. And so uh, we just wanted to, you know, lean into that. And and we could with those characters and, and really pick on her because that was the fun of it, taking everything and just amping it up. All these other TV shows that were made into movies had failed. So yes. that's why Paramount says, oh, here's 15 million. Just make whatever you want to make. You know, they didn't give us very much money. Nobody thought it would be anything. And then it was like, holy moly. Yeah, and it was it was the writing, I'm telling you. Because I, I, I always try to imagine that movie on paper and go, you know what? It was to me quite a risk like because you were so over the top about everything and if it had been performed differently it might have had a very different ending but they just delivered it so beautifully i they think it to life. i think it you know if we had come on at the very beginning and out of that tone they may have said no you can't do it this is too risky but because it was literally two weeks and she was casting and they were starting to shoot it it just was, we would write pages and throw them out and they'd film it. So nobody had a chance to really analyze it. And that's, you know, one of the big pet peeves I've have about Hollywood is that especially in television, but also in films, it's done so much by committee. So, so many people have to, you know, get their fingers on it and want to, mm-hmm. that by the time you see something, it's very diluted. I think that's why I love- This might have bypassed a bit of that. I love what is happening on streaming channels now because it's so much pure it, they are hiring people with a vision and they let them do it more than you do on network television yes yeah did you get to be with the brady movies both the the original and the sequel did you get to be there watching your lines come to life because i want i often wonder how they kept a straight face with some of that that material um we went we were on a job a tv show i think we were doing the gene wilder NBC show at the time of the first one. So there would be occasional days where we'd slip off. Like I was like, I have to be there when the monkeys are there because I was the monkeys freak. And I did go the night that uh, RuPaul was doing the guidance counselor scene. And I happened to be there and thank God I was. And I just whispered in Betty Thomas's ear, the director, I said, this was not in the script. I just said, um, just have them say at the end and Jan, you better work. And, <laughs> and she was like, why? And I said, just have just the, do it. Just have in the can. Like, and everyone's going, why? I mean, obviously RuPaul knew why I was doing it, but no one else knew the song. And then lo and behold, once she started editing and the, sh- the song exploded to middle America, she ended up using, you, you know, she put the music underneath it. And that got a huge laugh. And that was just luck. That was luck. That is so cool. Because I, mean, oh. I couldn't, I mean, so easily have not have gone there. And Jim didn't go that day, my writing partner. And, and I was like, I just want to go. I want to be around it as much as, as I can. 
That is so cool. Can I ask other other shows that you've watched over the years that you would have loved to have been a part of? I'm thinking, for example, uh, shows around that time and after Seinfeld, Simpsons, The Office. Were there films? Were there TV shows you wanted to get your hands on but couldn't? Bewitched. But you were too. Uh, you were too young, young for that. that. No, but we really wanted to do a, a the movie. Bewitched. Version. God, you just write one script and recycle it sixty times, don't you? Yeah. Um, we wanted to do Bewitched, and you know how they they switched Darrens on the show. Yeah. So we were gonna uh, hire Dermot Mulroney, and then uh, Dylan McDermott would switch in the middle and don't say anything. <laughs> oh, are you talking about making a remake of it? Yeah, we want to do the movie of it. Uh, oh, the movie was terrible. Wise, um, I mean, like this will seem very odd, but like there was this chance we were going to go on to Sybil, and that was—I really? mean, just to write for her and Christine Baranski, I think would have been super fun. Wow! Imagine if we did get a show on like Silver Foxes and what we could do with it. To me, that's there's stories I want to tell through my own ideas. There's a show on the BBC, or it's it's not there now. It's just every time you talk about the Silver Foxes, the the closest thing I can imagine to it is, um, and Ian McLennan is that his name? He's a very famous British actor. Oh, yes, I know Gary Janetti. Venomous wrote, so. or Poison? I think. Mm-hmm. Have you heard of that show? The yeah, British. Of it, yeah, yeah, yeah. So my friend Gary Janetti wrote that. Very oh right, yeah. yeah. Bloody! Good. I don't know. I, <clears throat> I actually don't know much about it, but I've I caught the the episodes I can. Which of which they don't seem to be very many. It's bloody good. No, it was a funny show, and those actors are, you know, obviously brilliant. And they just had just a funny relationship. I mean, it was it was real and complicated, and um, it was funny that they thought that their that their neighbor, hot young guy, was you know, always around. Vicious, that's the one. Yes, and right from the outset, the writer has obviously sat down and just went, "You know what? We're going to just go for it. We're going to yeah. go for the jugular every time." But see, it, in it is America, vicious. in America, you couldn't do that. They'd be like, "You got to make them nice, and people won't like them." What are you next about to sink your teeth into? What are you most excited about? Oh my gosh, <clears throat> we're writing a new musical. Um, doing my play right before I go, getting Silver Foxes up and going. I'm hopefully directing a new play called Have a Good One in L.A. in October, and it's about uh, Abercrombie and Fitch type story in 1999. And uh, it's four characters, all under 25. And, yes, two of them are shirtless male greeters. So, Final question, Stan. Could, could, they, could they bring the Golden Girls back these days? I think they should do a movie. Wow. Yeah. Share would be a good... Um, wow. Or, yeah. Here we go. Here we this go. Is why you're in, this is why you're a writer. That's a good idea. But I also heard someone pitch online something that they should do a Shady Pines series, which could be funny. Like, <laughs> That would be great. I think a lot of should, stories there. But I think it'd be funny if you did it as a period piece back in the 80s of Shady Pines. Yes. Yes. And somehow, oh. the, last, the last episode, um, Sophia shows up. Stan, it's been a pleasure. Thank you for talking to me. Well, thank you for inviting me.